Well, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for coming. It's great to be here today to highlight the good work of the state and industry to help uh, reduce injuries and workers' compensation costs in the logging and forestry sectors. Being that our state is 78% forested, this part of the economy is incredibly important to Vermont and has a deep cultural tradition here in our state. It also means our working landscape is a significant economic engine. This is why my administration has focused on addressing marketplace and affordability challenges for our forest economy. While there's a lot more work to do, we made some important progress over the last two and a half years. Working with the legislature, many of them right here behind me, um, we enacted the right to conduct forestry operations law, as well as sales and, and use and purchase and use tax exemptions for logging equipment and uh, repair parts, which brought Vermont more in line with our neighboring states and helps uh, keep more money in the pockets of Vermonters. My team will continue uh, to work with the legislature to pass proposals that would reduce the cost and level of difficulty dealing with Act 250 permits for those who process uh, forest products. And when you're looking at affordability for business oper businesses operating in our state, you must look at the costs of workers' compensation. This is insurance that all employers are required to have and it serves an important purpose, but it's one of the largest costs for many employers. And this has been especially true for loggers. This team behind me, including the departments of financial regulation, forest parks and recreation and labor have done incredible work alongside workers and employers throughout Vermont to lower worker compensation rates in recent years. As a result, we've seen rate decreases for three consecutive years. This means Vermont employers, on average, are paying about 20% less in workers' comp today than they did in 2016, adding up to about $40 million in savings for Vermont businesses. That's a big deal. And I want to thank everyone uh, for their efforts and everyone who was involved in the process and, and for their efforts. A big portion of these decreases has directly impacted the logging sector, which has historically had very high rates. To address this, the Department of Financial Regulation made changes to the workers' comp classification for log haulers, which greatly reduced the cost in that field. And last April, DFR separated mechanized logging from non-mechanized logging and created two new classifications to workers' comp uh, in that, that workers' comp system which will help the industry create safer workplaces and reduce costs. The bottom line is this, and what's really important to understand is that these savings are being achieved without sacrificing benefits or safety. And in fact, increased safety plays a key role in saving money. So I'm pleased now to invite uh, Sam Lincoln, who has been uh, integral in our administration, the Deputy Commissioner of Forest, uh, Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation, to talk a little bit more about what they're working on with the legislature to further reduce injuries in this sector. Sam? <coughs> Welcome, everyone. The Vermont Logger Safety and Workers' Compensation Insurance Program has been designed to deliver Vermont's forest economy a programmatic solution to directly address the root causes of the high cost of workers' compensation insurance, which has been a barrier to employment growth in this sector for decades. Expanding the safety training curriculum available to employers in one of the state's most dangerous occupations, adding on-site loss prevention consultations to verify that safe practices have been implemented, and directly connecting those activities to lower insurance premiums has been what has proven to be sustainable, sustainable to reduce injuries and costs in other states and countries. This program will also address the serious issue of insurance avoidance which limits the size of the insured pool over which the risk can be spread. We have developed guidance specifically for landowners and consulting foresters so they can determine that the logger working in their forest is properly insured or exempted from workers' compensation insurance. This will help level the playing field in the forest economy, both in-state and regionally. 
because there's a great disparity in the cost of doing business between an insured and uninsured logging operation. But that lower cost of doing business can come at the risk of an employee's well-being. Today, we welcome instructors from the Professional Logging Contractors of Maine, the Northeast Master Logger Program, and Acadia Insurance that bring experience and insight from a nearby forest economy and large pool of logging contractors that have been able to sustainably lower their injuries and costs significantly over time. We're embarking on a culture shift in Vermont's forest economy where a priority on safety at the job site and having the proper coverage for employees will become normalized. As an update to the typical chainsaw and tree felling safety training that loggers have experienced, we're modernizing that training for logging professionals in Vermont. And today's focus training is on for mechanized loggers and those who complete their work, most of their work from inside the cab of a machine such as the one behind me and they, they face very different hazards than their predecessors in traditional logging jobs. Next week they'll be learning about methods to successfully rescue injured and trapped loggers without exacerbating their injuries and more about rural first aid care. We're already planning for continuing education in 2020 that will bring an additional focus to the areas that we know are statistically unsafe for loggers and that they may not be aware of. Thank you uh, to Governor Scott for putting an emphasis and a team in place to focus on this long-standing issue. I'm very appreciative of the work of my colleagues, uh, not only at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, but the Department of Financial Regulation and Labor, uh, as well as uh, David Birdsall from the Logger Education to Advance Professionalism Program for their persistent work in this important area. Commissioner Snyder was unable to join us today, but his input and guidance has been essential in the development of this program along the way. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the support of this program by the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Vermont Woodlands Association who have been essential partners in messaging the importance of this work to their members. Uh, and most of all, I'd like to recognize the logging contractors both at today's training and yesterday's training that have all shut down their operations and brought their employees here to learn about these things and they're, they're investing in uh, a new culture. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Kevin Gaff from the Department of Finance and Regulation. Thank you, Sam. Uh, the, the Department of Financial Regulation, as the chief uh, insurance regulator in the state, undertook uh, a number of steps prior to wh where we are here today, including a legislative study in the summer of 2017. And from that study, we engaged with a contract actuary to look at different ways to uh, evaluate the workers' comp market uh, in generally and more specifically to the high-risk classes that are being challenged by the cost of workers' compensation insurance. And from those st studies, we came up with some structural uh, changes that um, were very impactful to uh, the marketplace. Uh, one was uh, the log hauler class, which is a very small class uh, that was actually having good experience, but the way rate making t uh, happens in insurance, the, your rates are based on the size of your class. So we looked at an opportunity to combine with a very similar classification commercial trucking, and we were able to save the log haulers 24% on their insurance rates. Um, additionally, there was a surcharge applied in the assigned risk market that was uh, intended to be an incentive to improve um, loss results, but it really became a punitive barrier to employers actually growing their business. And we eliminated that surcharge and actually saved the marketplace 7% for those rates. Additionally, as the governor mentioned, we've seen very positive uh, loss results over the last three years with the uh, rates going down over 20%. And one of the key drivers behind that is um, frequency of claims. The actual frequency is going down. Um, oftentimes when the frequency of claims goes down, it puts pressure on the average size of the claim. But actually that's normalized and actually for the medical losses, it's actually gone down slightly in the last three years. So these are positive results that we really see as an opportunity uh, and a, a virtuous cycle and an opportunity to engage as these uh, logging professionals are doing today in ways to become even more safer. Because as we take rates down, it's gonna be more critical to conduct greater and greater safe practices to enhance those results in the future. Um, these, these individuals will uh, receive a credit through a two-step certification process. And so part of that process is just here today, doing the, uh, in the controlled environment training, which is very important, 
It's very important to be competent uh, in, your, in your profession, and this training is going to enhance that. But to be proficient, we found, our research has shown that you really have to conduct uh, on-site observations of in-the-woods activity for each employer. So the, the department is excited to announce a uh, contract awarded to W.J. Cox, who is going to do loss prevention services and verification uh, of those practices learned today in the individual employer's work sites. Uh, we're very excited that uh, Cox, who has 40 years of experience in the forestry industry in loss prevention services, is uh, able to serve Vermonters. And the department will serve as the uh, chief compliance uh, um, uh, agency to oversee those activities, monitor them, and also just reassess uh, learnings. We're going we're to actually get feedback from the forest industry on those best practices and how to be best refine those to make sure we have uh, better results in the future and, and improve rates uh, down the road. Um, and and uh, uh, additionally, um, uh, I'd just like to thank the governor. Uh, I think that he has promoted interagency and interdepartmental collaboration to deal with complex uh, issues like this. And I think the working with labor and forest parks and recreation uh, is a good example of uh, government tackling a complex issue from different disciplinary backgrounds. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. And I'll turn it over to the Governor. So at this point, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions about the topic uh, at this point, and then we, we can take uh, other questions after. How many logging accidents are there each year? Um, I will ask for a lifeline here. <laughs> um, Sorry to ask you a question. <laughs> Do we have any idea? Why don't you come on up? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the actual number. I know the uh, the frequency of, of claims has gone down about 18 percent in the last three years, um, but uh, the actual uh, claim count, obviously, in this industry, it's um, it's more about severity than it is frequency. Oftentimes, like uh, what we're trying to do today is loss prevention uh, and loss avoidance, but it's mostly loss. Mitigation. In other words, you don't want to you don't want to have the loss in the first place because oftentimes they're severe. So it's not usually about the claim count that gives you the indication of success, but but also the the severity of those losses. So some of the training that's happening next week that Sam could talk more about is actually the post-accident mitigation. So how, when something bad happens, do you mitigate the extent of that injury? Why have claims gone down? It's actually a, na a nationwide uh, uh, phenomena right now that we're in a, a cycle of low claims activity. I, I think there's more and more engagement on the part of employers. They realize that as these individuals are today, to invest in their business and to invest in a culture of safety is going to save them money on their insurance. So I think there's that's part of it. Uh, there's also overall uh, maybe a shift in more mechanized ways of doing things that could mitigate uh, the frequency of losses talk about the sort of the cost, the high cost of this. What is the average cost uh, to a logging business um, to, to, to be able to pay for a year's worth of? So that's, a, that's not a, a simple answer, a question to answer, but I can answer it in these terms. Uh, so insurance costs are based on uh, payroll. So it's, it's basically a per uh, uh, 100 of payroll. Um, so it's a percentage, basically. So for uh, mechanized loggers, that, that can run anywhere from 15 to 16 percent of payroll, and for non-mechanized loggers, uh, 36 percent of payroll. Um, on, uh, some more good news early next year will be that we have seen these trends continue, and we're just received rates for the 2020 rate filing. They're not going to be uh, vetted or official to the end of the year, but they are showing continued improvement in those areas. So we expect to see those rates go down even more substantially, perhaps, than in the prior three years. How many people work in the modern in this state? No. Uh, it's it's uh, in the in the high hundreds. It's there's no particular way that they're all counted at once, but we estimate it's in the high hundreds to many as, as uh, the last uh, the 2013 numbers I think showed a little around a thousand uh, people employed in logging in the state, give roughly, take. give or take. And that includes 
arborists and people like that, or is it just? Well, that would just be loggers. Just loggers, okay. And the, and Do you have any average cost for per employee for the application of the um of the insurance uh, of the uh, for if somebody gets hurt? What, what's the average? The cost average claim. The average. The average no, claim. Not the claim. The. Uh, the average premium. the premium is is that percent of payroll, oh, percent so it's either that sixteen or thirty six okay. percent of payroll. And a year ago, it was about twenty four. Okay. I paid twenty four percent for trucking and logging, right. and it has gone down some, which is a step in the right direction. I'd like to reiterate one thing that Sam said is. Why don't you size, come, on, come on up here? The size, of, on up. the size of the pool Bruce. is in direct correlation. To what we pay for insurance, so that if if you have about ten people in the insur being insured compared to, I think they said in Maine it was twelve hundred, it definitely makes a huge difference in what we pay, and, and twenty five percent that means that every hundred dollars twenty five dollars had to go to workman's comp. Um, is anyone allowed to opt out? Mm, maybe if you're a single person or a family you, you got to have workman's comp theoretically but that's the biggest problem in this state is very what percentage of the loggers have workman's comp sam there's uh there's uh the last numbers we have there were about 70 businesses and 70 employers in the state that had workers compensation insurance uh officers of a corporation can exempt themselves uh, sole proprietors in Vermont are allowed to exempt themselves from workers' compensation insurance. That's in any business, though. In any just business. in the logging right. in the trade. So, um, and so we've developed this guidance that asks landowners essentially to, to uh, ask for a list for, of uh, when someone's going to log on their land, that they ask for a list of who's there and whether they're covered or exempted. Uh, and we've backed that up with, with, with uh, um, what, what state law requires. So. I, I want to emphasize as well, when I talked about earlier about mechanized versus non-mechanized, mechanized here. Uh, and in the past, uh, as, as some of these folks can attest to, it was a different scenario. I mean, we were doing everything pretty much by hand, uh, and now we can do it here. So, but all the rates were pooled together. And, and that was the part of the problem, was you, you, you could do things safer sometimes with a, a mechanized device, but everything was pooled together. So the rate was increased, correct? You know, that's yeah. not exactly correct. Okay, well, tell us then. So, so um, as of ten, nine, 10 years ago when I started my business, the, the rate for hand felling, um, for hand felled logging was 33%. Over the next five years, the rate jumped to 54%. So it was 54 cents on the dollar for every, every dollar of wages you paid. But there's always been that separation for at least the last five years of mechanized versus non-mechanized. The latest mechanized rate, maybe not this last year, but 2018, was 23 cents on the dollar for, for mechanized and 53, 52, 53 cents for non-mechanized. The highest it's been in the last 10 years has been 54 cents on the dollar for non-mechanized. So those are, those are the numbers. So what is it for non-mechanized now? Non-mechanized, um, I, I actually dropped my non-mechanized employees um, after it was 54 cents on the dollar. And I dropped that off of my policy and those people now work in some other industry. So, yeah. But the point is, mechanized is... is, is mechanized is significantly cheaper right. for insurance. Right. Um, non-mechanized was not, it wasn't feasible to ha hire someone a, an employee, as an employee when you have to pay half of their wages to insurance. One other point I would like to make is the pool is supposed to be the most expensive place to get insurance, but if an insurance company would take you, you couldn't get put in the pool, and you could be paying 20% more through an insurance company, and the pool was cheaper, but you couldn't get in it as long as you was accepted with some other insurance company. Other questions on topic? I just want to re reiterate something. So if I heard correctly, if you're non-mechanized, you're paying more than half, 50 cents in a dollar for your... Could, right? Yeah, the non-mechanized rate that was referenced earlier, the 54, was that number five years ago. Five years ago. Okay. And right now we're at 36, <laughs> and we expect that number to be, to have a different first number uh, in, the, in the 2020 filing. So we've made significant progress in, in that area, and... Uh, 
Uh, the mechanized always has had a lower because of the nature of that work. It has other risks from an insurance standpoint in terms of equipment and other non-workers comp related issues. But the trend line has changed both as a consequence of regulatory reform and fewer claims and better safety. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're looking at, uh, Vermont's always going to have a, a scale uh, question, but I think we're looking at a way to recognizing credit employers that have had good experience over long periods of time, even though they're small, and to give that experience greater weight than we had traditionally in the past. Yeah, uh, uh, obviously, and I, I'm just talking uh, from someone that is seeing this uh, from the same perspective uh, as you. I mean, I'm not on the inside. I don't know all the inner workings of what's what's happening, um, but it sure uh, seems as though it's becoming uh, more politicized on both sides, uh, which is unfortunate. What I'd like to see uh, during this process is, first, I think I think there is a responsibility of Congress to take a vote on this, and and let us know what they think, and then move forward from there. Um, as well, I think that the process should be transparent. I said that uh, in my earlier statement. I believe that we should be able to hear uh, what's happening in the hearings. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure that we're seeing that now. And I'm a little confused now because I thought Congress was uh, on a two-week break. Uh, but I don't know if they're having hearings now or they're not having hearings. So from my perspective, just more transparency. Make sure that we hear everything they hear. Um, obviously, this whistleblower um, considerations, and, and that's not going to be as tra transparent as and it probably shouldn't be. Um, but at the same time, we just like to hear what's going on. So, so let me see if I understand what you're saying. Is it fair to say that you're criticizing Democrats for not making the process more transparent? But I, is that is that well, fair? I'm not. I'm and, not. I'm and not. I have uh, a follow-up yeah. on that. Yeah, I I, I'm not. I'm not criticizing uh, Democrats for doing this. I'm, I'm criticizing Congress. Okay. Um, and I think that Congress should be more transparent. That's what we want uh, throughout this process. Right, none of the Republicans in the House are interested in this process. Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. So take a vote. Um, take a vote and see whether we should move forward. And I'll put everybody uh, on the spot and let's see where they, where they come out. And then we'll know for sure, right? I see. And what do you think about um, the fact that the president has refused to let White House officials testify in any way? Again, more gamemanship. Uh, I uh -huh. just want the facts. Yeah. So you think the president I think should, everyone. Allow, should, should insist that Pompeo and others testify? I think everyone should, should come mm -hmm. forward, uh, get the facts on the table, and uh, then see where that takes us from there. But I think that everyone should should um, it, it, take a vote, mm -hmm. um, move forward with this inquiry, uh, and then get the facts on the table. And you've shared your views with President Trump? I have uh, <laughs> not yet. I have not uh, had a, uh, an are there, opportunity. Are there any other GOP officials who have expressed some I have views? not spoken to anyone else about this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There are some Republicans, not many, like Susan Collins, like Mitt Romney, who, especially after the China thing, which, you know, he said uh, on camera, inviting now a second government to get involved. Um, does that change anything for you? Uh, does it seem, as they put it, appalling and wrong? Does, does it strike you that way? Well, I don't know if it changes anything for me. I think I was uh, clear in uh, believing that we should move forward. I think that there should be a vote on the inquiry, move forward, uh, have uh, an investigation to see if, if, uh, if the charges, the allegations rise to the level of impeachment and then move from there. Well, do you think they have enough to uh, impeach I have now? no idea. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Um, again, this is a political process. It's probably not a legal process, more of a political process. And, uh, and I believe that uh, we as, as citizens uh, deserve to hear what's going on, and then we might be able to make our own determination. But I'm not sure that we're hearing everything uh, that's happening, and that's why it's important, again, to be transparent, have a vote, move forward with the inquiry if that's what the vote, um, and it appears that they, they have enough votes for that, move forward with that, and then have uh, the inquiry uh, to see if the, the charges, the allegations rise to that level, and then go from there. Would you rather 
that we just, we have an election in 13 months, settle it then? I don't think um, that, that impeachment, an impe I, I hope uh, that they don't, uh, that the allegations do not rise to the level of impeachment, uh, because I don't believe it's good for the country. Uh, we, uh, we have enough polarization as it is right now. Uh, we have enough disruption uh, in our country. And I'd like to focus, uh, I'd like for Congress to be able to focus on other, other things that really matter. And not that this doesn't matter, but, you know, we have the, the USMCA, um, the, uh, that, uh, that trade agreement uh, that's on the table that should be dealt with. I mean, this is something that would benefit Vermont and benefit most of the country. And Canada has agreed. Uh, Mexico has agreed. We should ratify it. We should move forward on that. We should, we should upgrade our, our immigration policy. You know, this is something that, that we're all dealing with in some way. So let's, let's work on that. So there are other areas uh, as well that need attention. And I'm hoping uh, that we can move beyond this uh, and, then, uh, and then focus on the, uh, the issues at hand. But it seems like, isn't it a chicken or egg thing? I mean, Congress, it would appear, hasn't moved forward on impeachment because they don't feel like they have enough information. So where do you, you well, know, where do you draw do the, the line? Do the inquiry. Uh -huh. You know, I, I okay. you know, I, I, so it seems like they're doing that. Put people on, well, I don't know if they are or not, right? Yeah. I, I, I haven't, I, I haven't, I don't know if you've seen any of the hearings uh, that they've conducted. <laughs> I mean, they're, they are interviewing witnesses. I mean, what do you want to see that isn't, well, you wanna, have you, you have hearings. you heard what they've said? Well, no, but there, yeah, there have been some public, um, some, but part of this has some, to do with the president and he doesn't want people to be in a public hearing. And they're trying to negotiate with him to get well, information. Well, again, I, I think right. everyone should be on the record, uh -huh. and then we should we should make that determination ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We we should hear what's going on, mm -hmm. so we can we can come to our own conclusions, and they can come to theirs. Mm -hmm. um, the ACLU yesterday came out with a big slew of recommendations for reducing the prison population in Vermont, and two of the ones, yeah. the things that they want, sort of they see as the most reasonable to be taken up in 2020 are parole sort of reform um, and looking at bail and the elimination of cash bail. Um, we've talked about this a lot in the past. Is there anything, I don't know if you've read, have you read that report, first of all? I just heard, uh, you know, just the surface. Um, um, is I, think there I, I think I heard something about, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but something about uh, uh, reducing the population by about 50%, which would be fairly dramatic. It's 50% from what it was in 2009, so oh, like 500 more inmates. But, um, I mean, is that something that you want to do? Do you want to reduce the population? If so, how do well, you see I, any? Well, again, I, I want, <laughs> if we could prevent people uh, from going, becoming incarcerated by uh, them uh, behaving better, that would be the solution. Um, having said that, we took a, a lot of steps. When I was in the legislature in 2009, uh, reducing the, the population by 500 was dramatic. We've, we've taken a lot of steps that other states have not. Uh, so we've done a lot of that work. Um, so I'm not sure um, what, and I'm sure we can always improve, uh, and more than willing to take a look case by case uh, on, on who is incarcerated that shouldn't be uh, and, and where we go from there. Uh, but I would say uh, the majority of those incarcerated now are serious offenders, felon, felons. And, and I, I, would be, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm not sure who, uh, if, if, you were, if you were to reduce the population, who's it going to be? What about people who are being detained pre-trial, um, who you know, can't afford to make bail, or people who are readmitted on a parole violation? Those are two things they think maybe there could be some consensus on, you know, not incarcerating for those sorts of uh, violations. Well, certainly can have the conversation, uh, but I don't know what it really means. The details do matter, and, and I'm sure that we'll have this conversation uh, in this legislative session and then come to some conclusion. But, um, but again, from, from my standpoint, I want to make sure public safety is uh, of utmost concern to me, uh, protecting victims, protecting the general public, uh, and making sure that we don't, uh, we don't, take, we don't have a ripple effect and, and that we, we do this carefully. Governor, we've had several stories, one that we published and then one that came from the Valley News about uh, the Defender General's Office and lack of funding for defense attorneys and the number of people who are being detained for a very long time because their cases have not been brought forward. Is there any uh, 
feeling from your office that there should be more money put into the Defender General's program uh, to alleviate that problem? Well, the, the Defender General uh, obviously uh, is uh, is free to, to, to come and uh, make their proposals and, and what it would cost. I'm not sure uh, mm -hmm. what uh, what the answer is, uh, but uh, but we'll have that conversation, I'm sure, uh, when we talk about our budgets in, in January. So um, I invite the Defender General to come forward and, and, and talk to us about uh, what his plans are and, and what uh, what the needs are. We had some rather uh, stunning violence in Rutland yesterday morning. Uh, what, what is your takeaway at this point, uh, knowing that not all of the facts are out, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, um, tragic event, uh, obviously, uh, for those uh, in Rutland, for those uh, family members uh, involved. I, I'm very thankful uh, that uh, no one um, no one was hurt um, from uh, the law enforcement perspective uh, and uh, and just I guess it reinforces uh, the fact uh, that um, it appears that some of this could be drug related we're not sure at this point the investigation is ongoing um, but uh, but no one was left untouched uh, no matter what family you're, you belong to uh, and it's something that uh, we still continue to have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of uh, trying to, to overcome that. Even if you're the son of a mayor. Absolutely. Governor, on Monday, uh, Burlington City Councilors approved a proposal that would uh, allow non-U.S. <coughs> citizens to vote. Um, legislature will be considering Montpelier's charter change. Could you just kind of refresh us on where you stand on that idea? Yeah, I mean, my thoughts haven't changed uh, since the vote in in, uh, in uh, Burlington. Um, I did read uh, the statement from one. Uh, there was two, uh, uh, two councillors uh, that voted against the proposal. Uh, I tend to agree with both of them. Uh, that, um, but we need to, to really, really be careful as we move forward with anything like this. Uh, and for the reasons I stated before, whether it's a, a registry, the unintended consequences of having some sort of registry at that point, uh, which we fought against uh, over the last two or three years, as you might might recall. Um, and I've, I've heard, you know, in my years in the legislature, there were many business, uh, 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 business members uh, who thought uh, they were paying uh, uh, high taxes in, in, the, uh, in the community that they, were, they, they had their businesses, but they had no vote. Uh, so where does that lead us then? Are we going to allow people that, who have businesses to vote as well? Uh, because they're impacted uh, as well. And I, it just hits me uh, as being, I don't know if, it, it, just, it just hits me as, as not being right. Um, that, you know, we, uh, there's an obligation as citizens to vote. I think we should be focusing on trying to get more people to vote uh, that, uh, that have that privilege. Uh, and we, uh, we, we, uh, we're not doing a very good job of that. Uh, when you see the numbers, uh, to be honest with you, on the local level in particular, but but I'm sure this will be taken up uh, by the legislature. Uh, they um, they had the proposal from Montpelier. Now they'll have the uh, proposal from Burlington, and we'll see where we go from here. But you're a no. I, I'm yeah. I'm not in favor uh, uh, at this point in time. My feelings haven't changed. The class of 2020. They're uh, the first ones. Um, they're going graduating with profic proficiency-based grading. They don't get A, B, C, or D. They get basically a pass or fail. Um, we're speaking with students, and they are applying to schools, and they're saying that colleges and universities across the country don't really understand the system, so some of these students feel like they're put at a disadvantage. Um, what are you hearing from students yeah. and teachers? Well, uh, obviously, this was passed long before I became uh, governor, uh, this was, I think, uh, as a result of legislation in 2013. Uh, so this has been around for a while. I've heard a controversy as well, uh, going to different communities, uh, speaking to people, uh, lack of understanding about what it means, and and uh, and I and there's a lot of confusion uh, surrounding this. So um, I know um, I know the NEA has some concerns. Uh, I would say that they uh, they should uh, they should come forward. I have conversations with the education committees in the House and the Senate and see where we go from here. But uh, this is as a result of legislation that was passed a number of years ago. And looking at uh, your administration, you're really trying to get people to move to the state. 
um, for families coming here, uh, kids who are going to, going to be entering the uh, school system, they feel like they might be put at a disadvantage. I guess sort of where do we balance that of trying to recruit new families, yet there's some ambiguity of, of how schools interpret these grades. Yeah, obviously there needs to be clarification uh, of what this means and whether it, whether it's working or not. I think uh, at this point in time we could probably, uh, the, the Board of Education and, and the Education Committees could take a look and see whether this uh, this really is suited to Vermont and whether it had the desired effect uh, that, it, that it was intended to have uh, and whether we should uh, continue or discontinue uh, this, uh, this different type of grading system. Um, because I believe uh, education is, is key to trying to attract more families to Vermont. Uh, I've talked about a, a cradle to career uh, type of opportunity, uh, education system from, uh, from early uh, care and learning uh, through technical training and higher education and trying to lump it all together. Because uh, if we can become uh, the, uh, the number one uh, education system in the country, uh, this would uh, this would lead to more people, more families moving to Vermont, who we desperately need. Governor, is the state working on a settlement with the EB-5 investors? Um, I am not uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, that's probably a better question for the AG. Should the state work on a settlement? With um, EB5 well, investors? I think I would love to see us come to conclusion on EB-5, mm -hmm. as you probably would uh, as well. And uh, it seems as though with the recent uh, um, 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 court uh, determination that we are at least narrowing and focusing and getting more towards uh, an end uh, and uh, and that would be uh, preferable from my standpoint how are we narrowing well I mean I, mean, I, I think they eliminated uh, there was a couple of uh, cases that, that were eliminated uh, at least one in particular uh -huh. um, and uh, and I think they narrowed down uh, the number of people Mm -hmm. uh, who uh, who could be culpable? Mm -hmm. I think that's narrowing, uh, sure. and uh, so but I think the state we're state itself. Then we'll correct. To... Well, that's moving on with the court process at this point. Uh huh. Okay. And what does what is the state's total liability? I have no idea. I I have no idea. Does the state have? Is the state self-insured? The state is self-insured. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the deductible? I don't think, uh, well, I think we self-insure, so there's probably uh -huh. no deductible. No deductible, okay. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> we have a, I have an expert in the room. Uh, uh, Mr. Pichak. Mr. Pichak. No, I think that's right. The state is self-insured for most of these um, losses that they've mm -hmm. experienced, you know, outside of this context and other contexts as well. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean you're resp the state's responsible for whatever the cost might be? Well, I think that's a long way down the road. I mean, as the governor said, you know, the, the individuals, the claims have been narrowed. There's still a long legal process ahead, uh, even in sort of this initial phase in terms of doing the due diligence and collecting the facts and the information uh, well before a judge makes another determination, potentially uh, at a summary judgment phase. So there's still a lot of time in this. So, um, you know, uh, settlement is, you know, not something uh, that we're thinking about at this point in terms of uh, you know, what are our options? We need to think about, you know, what are the pass forward? What are the items that we need to get, collect to make sure that um, we have all the information on the table? Um, but of course, we're also thinking about what's the exposure to the state uh, and trying to limit any exposure to taxpayers. I think it's important to note that uh, we paid out over $100 million uh, in claims already in context of the EB-5 uh, case. Those are monies that have come from settlements our department has had, that Mike Goldberg has had, has paid back vendors and contractors in the Northeast Kingdom paid back uh, many, many investors, including the five investors that are filing the suit against the state. So there has been a lot of progress, more progress certainly to be made, um, but uh, we'll stay tuned. Isn't 300 million still owed? So- uh, When you do the Delta, it's 400 million that was invested, 100 million paid out. So right. some of that 100- Simple math is 300. So there's still obviously the resorts that have to be sold. There's still good assets mm -hmm. that the receiver has that he's gonna liquidate. Uh, the only uh, people that have an interest in those assets now are the investors. Uh, due to the payment of uh, the contractors, due to the payment of the vendors. So that's all good work in terms of cleaning up the mess. Um, they're still investors. We are uh, working hard to ensure that they get their immigration benefit. That was A, number one in terms of their priority. And then also working close to the receiver to make sure they get as much uh, of that money back uh, as possible. I mean, another thing that you have to think about is um, not just you know the misappropriation, but what were the economic realities of the projects themselves? 
Uh, so every dollar that was put into that project, just from an economic standpoint, uh, didn't result in a dollar of value. It resulted in something less than that. Uh, so that is going to yeah, make it. Yeah, because money was stolen. No, I'm saying separate from that, the economic mm -hmm. reality that the dollar that was invested, you know, turned into much less than a dollar of value in terms of the location of the properties, how much revenue could be produced from those properties. So that's something to think about too, in terms of the sale of the properties and how much might be left uh, for investors. So what's, how is this going to be resolved in terms of the, the green cards and permanent residency of the investors since the EB-5 center's been shut down? I mean, where do they go from here and what responsibility does the state have to them? So we're continuing our, our focus on that. We have options in, ahead of us in terms of what the state does. Like uh, what? So either we can file a motion to reconsider, we can bring a case in federal court but as you well. you already did that. Uh, those these actions that we've taken to date are within the regional center, or sorry, within the USCIS uh, administrative agency. Uh -huh. uh, so we haven't filed a federal case. We haven't filed a motion to reconsider. We filed an appeal within the agency. Uh, so we have various legal options in front of us. I think it's important for us to continue to pursue so you're gonna, those. You're going to file a federal case? Uh, we're not saying that. We have we have an option, for example, for motion to reconsider. Those are options that we're considering now. Uh, we'll take the one that we think is most advantageous to the investors. At the end of the day, that's who we're trying to uh, help here and trying to make sure they get their immigration benefit. So it could be years, is what you're saying. I mean, if it goes through a federal court process, it's already been three years. So what are we talking? Another two? Yeah, again, I mean, I think we have to do what is best for the investors. We have to make sure that that regional center uh, is viable so that they can get their immigration benefit. We're not looking to take on new projects, as we've said, uh, but we think there's an obligation for us to do everything we can to make sure those investors have the best opportunity to get their immigration benefit. So, uh, say, Trap Brewery or Mount Snow, the investors in those projects, couldn't they also choose to sue the state? Uh, because they don't have their green cards? You know, there's everyone has options in front of them. We're all right now uh, working together on this collaboratively, and that's the uh, path that we plan to take Who's going forward. Who's all working collaboratively? The projects, the investors, the, you know, we all have the same interests here. Uh, so we're trying to work collectively to make sure USCIS understands the impact that it will have on, on these individuals, uh, the potential impact on the projects, um, and that's, you know, most important to us. I can ask you about uh, the housing bond. You championed that uh, in your first year. Uh, I was at a housing event this week, large one, up in Chittenden County, and the big nonprofit advocate, uh, housing developers said, you know, that money is now entirely committed to projects around the state. And we are now, in the next few months, going to go back to where we were, which is a trickle of affordable housing construction. Um, that sounded like an opening for housing bond number two. Well, How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, uh, I want to make sure that we understand that it may be committed, uh, but we haven't seen all the projects uh, come to fruition. Um, so some of them are in the early stages and, and haven't been built yet. So we're not at the end of the line in, in some respects. Uh, the second part, I don't mind talking uh, about another uh, bonding uh, opportunity, but we do have to, to be concerned about our overall debt. Uh, and what this means. The Debt Affordability Committee, the Treasurer has to be involved. And at this point in time, I'm not sure that we want any more debt, but we can have the conversation uh, at some point, but I'm not sure that it's right now. So it won't be in your in your uh, 2020 inaugural? Um, we'll see. We'll see. You never know. Governor, are you going to investigate whether any EV-5 records are missing at the Agency of Digital Service? Um, I'm concerned uh, about any records missing, um, and, uh, and but I'm not quite sure uh, where we go from here, uh, to be honest with you. If you've they don't the exist, I'm not sure yeah, where they are. Yeah, computing suggested that an investigation should be conducted. Are you going to do that? Um, again, I, I haven't consulted with our, our CIO or, and ADS on this uh, in terms of whether investigation uh, is appropriate and whether we would... It would, it would be helpful. But, but again, I'm more than willing to have the conversation with our, with our with secretary of uh, ADS, on this. Okay. So when are you going to have that conversation? Uh, pr probably in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'm close to a Supreme Court justice. I just started the process, actually. Um, conducted uh, a couple of interviews thus far. So, got a ways to go. A few more to go. Yep. A few months ago, I think you had expressed interest or sent a letter 
to DHS about a meeting with the feds about prescription drug uh, policy and importing. Did that ever? Did you ever hear back from them? I, that... To my knowledge, uh, we have not received a response mm -hmm. uh, on that. Um, hearing some um, rumblings of uh, maybe action on the federal level uh, in this regard, what what they would accept, what they wouldn't, but uh, but I don't believe we've received a response at this point. But they, but, but I, I, I can check. Put the, put the ruling, there's a ruling coming out, and we're sort of uh, on hold for that ruling, which I think should be coming out soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you.